Um, so our final presenter for this session um, is going to be Jamal Montessar from the Open Money Initiative. Um, and he's gonna be talking to us about money at the edge. So welcome. Can you guys switch this monitor back to my slides because I can't actually click. Oh, it's on there. Great. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Great. So my name is Jamal. I'm one of the three co-founders of the Open Money Initiative. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about money on the edge, so designing for extremes in Venezuela. And just some quick background uh, before I get started. So Venezuela is a socialist petrostate and in the midst of one of the largest economic crises in the world. So uh, they're estimated to have about 10 million percent inflation. And to put a brass tax on that, um, when it was estimated to be a million percent inflation, if you had put in a million US dollars into the boulevard in 2013 and tried to pull it out, today you would have less than a dollar. I don't know what the math is for 10 million percent inflation. Um, but before I talk about the research that we did overseas, I want to share a little bit of background on myself and my how I came to approach problems the way we did for this research project. So I'm a designer and engineer. And I spent the early part of my engineering um, career and engineering studies actually working in international development. And so I spent a lot of time um, overseas and uh, <laughs> you know, with great aspirations of helping other people, but quickly realized that often new technology in isolation made in, say, a research lab or you know, me thinking it up in, in Canada, where I was from, um, often has a ton of implementation challenges in the field. And so you can imagine, say, coming up with a new type of filter for water uh, would be a great idea. But for people who have been living in a small village and have been drinking that water for all of their life, they may not even realize that that water is making them sick. And so they may not even care to switch because it doesn't make sense. And they may not even understand that there's small little microbes or things in the water that they can't see that are making them sick. And so not only that, um, there was questions of access. So if this well is built in, say, a chief's yard, they can gate who can access it. So what is the process for designing you know, where it gets built? Um, there's questions of ownership. If I come and build a well, what happens when it breaks? And what do people, local people think when it breaks? And so I want to zoom forward to this last year where um, my co-founders and I were wondering this question. How might we find ways to make cryptocurrency useful to people in closed economies and collapsing monetary systems? And the better question which we ended up asking, because you never want to approach a problem, especially for a context which you don't know, with the solution in mind was how might we serve people in closed economies and collapsing monetary systems, right? We didn't have the cultural context, the social fabric context, the systemic context, um, and so we wanted to approach the problem humbly. And before we get into the research, I wanna give you a quick overview of sort of our approach. So we used something called human-centered design. So you know, after my, the early part of my career working in international development, I was drawn to design, went to graduate school and became a designer. And this basically means that we put people at the center of our process. Um, and so uh, understanding not just you know, how someone would fill out a survey and say, you know, do you like Monero or Bitcoin, yes or no, but what are people doing and why are they doing it? What are their attitudes, their behaviors? What are they inclined to do and not do? What do their peers think of what they're doing? And so our process was very much design research. It wasn't academic research in the sense of, you know, you can ask me how many people are using cryptocurrency in the field, I, ha I have no idea. What we did was research where we were interested in extremes. So often research is thought to be at the middle of the bell curve, you're looking for a mean, we're on the edges. We're looking for outliers, people who have found a way to hack the system or to thrive or survive while, while the system is collapsing around them. 
So what does that actually look like? Um, that includes ethnographic interviews. So we spent quite a bit of time in, in Colombia on the border in Cucuta. It was a little bit too dangerous for us to go to Venezuela, so we did quite a bit of remote interviews. These ethnographic interviews are about two hours long, and we often like to do them in context, so where people live or where they work, to understand um, sort of their life in a more deep way. We did a bunch of diary studies. These are longitudinal studies over seven days where we had people report in how are they using money, what are they buying, what kind of financial challenges are they facing, um, just to understand, you know, outside of an interview that is two hours, we want to understand what's happening in people's lives over time. And the last part of our study was two displacements, and these basically mean um, they're, they're kind of interesting experiments where you're trying to displace incumbent behavior for your participants. So we did two of them. One of them, we tried to use Bitcoin as a currency to pay, for all goods that someone was going to buy that week, which we know is not, is not very conducive, right? So that was displacement one. Um, and then displacement two, we um, worked with a money changer to try and convert the back end of their business, the liquidity pool they had for sending money between the US, Colombia, and Venezuela. Um, we tried to convert the US dollar liquidity pool to Bitcoin um, to see if that would make the business run better. Um, after all of that research, we did synthesis, which this is a little taste of the hours and hours and weeks of, of writing quotes down, observations, and trying to understand what we're seeing from the field. So let's, let's take you to Venezuela. So this is a video from March 2019 of a lineup. And this is extraordinarily typical in Venezuela where there are extreme shortages of all kinds of products, everything from food stuff to feminine hygiene products to toilet paper. Um, but this line in particular is a lineup to a bank to get cash, to get Boulevard. And the line keeps going and going. And this is very typical. So after I got back from our, our research overseas, um, I would get this question from people, or, or you know, maybe for this conference, the more appropriate question would be, why don't they use Monero? Um, and the reality is that on the ground, nobody wants the boulevard. Everyone understands that it's like you know, melting ice. The value of your money is disappearing on daily, right? A million percent inflation is very quick. But the boulevard is extraordinarily undesirable, but it's the official money of commerce. So it's government, government mandated, right? So merchants, merchants might do their back end accounting in another currency like US dollars or Bitcoin, um, but they have to list prices in Boulevard to be compliant with the law. And furthermore, the country is extraordinarily gated in access to other financial jurisdictions or other currencies. And I, I, I mean that quite literally, like there is no way to send money in or out of the country. There's not even a Western Union in Venezuela. So the, the boulevard depreciates by the hour, and it creates this extremely high time preference for when you're holding it. So if you're a money changer, this means you know if you get boulevard, you want to offload those right away. Um, and if you're holding another currency or, or another asset, you want sort of the just-in-time manufacturing approach of, I'm just going to convert exactly what I need when I need it, so I'm not holding boulevard. But that is far and few people who actually have access to other assets. For example, this is actually, so we, we met uh, a woman named Anna Maria. We've changed all the names of the people we've met. We don't put photos of any of the people we've met. But she's an engineering student um, in the capital city in Venezuela. And she's one of the few Bitcoin users or cryptocurrency users at all that we met in our process, uh, our research process. Um, I think she, so she learned about Bitcoin from her boyfriend, um, who is also sort of a nerdy engineer. And um, they use local Bitcoins to convert to Boulevard when they need local cash. So if she's going to the movies, she'll convert just the amount that she needs for the movies. Um, and the miners that they run are actually enough to support her whole family now. So the economy has largely collapsed in Venezuela. Um, and jobs, um, despite having a job, you know, we met everyone from professors to transportation professionals, 
those salaries aren't adjusted for inflation. So often you're doing side jobs and things like that to get enough money. But understanding this context of, OK, so why don't they just use cryptocurrency? Why don't they just use another currency? Well, it's actually because the boulevard is needed to pay for things. Begs the question of how might we increase local liquidity and elevate the safety and ease of tapping into it. So often, you know, as a product designer, I'm thinking about solutions and services, but designing, say, like a, 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 a cryptocurrency wallet to work on old Android phones isn't necessarily going to help someone, right? It's like you need to design different mechanisms for on and off ramps or cash in, cash out. And knowing that means the design solution, the product, is going to be very different than just this isolated wallet on a phone. You have to design for the context. Another thing that we learned in the field was that multiple mediums and currencies create a barter-like system. So people obviously don't want <laughs> um, money for money's sake. And because there's this gated access, people have access to different um, bank accounts overseas. Some people might have a euro account. Some people might have a US dollar account. Uh, people might have US dollar cash in Venezuela. And because of the extreme scarcity of products, if you are a product seller and you have the luck to have something like uh, a medication, you get to choose how you get paid, which means even if you had, say, US dollars cash or US dollar bank account, but the, 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 the seller wants euro or wants a Zelle US dollar transfer, but you only have US dollar cash, you cannot get it. And this is exemplified by Julio, who we met, um, who finally found his mom's, uh, I believe it's Parkinson's medication, um, and he found it through, a what's, uh, I think, a WhatsApp group or Instagram group, Instagram story. And uh, the seller would only accept a Zelle transfer. And he didn't have a Zelle trans, uh, a US dollar bank account to initiate this transfer, so he ended up using his uncle's. But this is sort of the system that's in place where it starts to feel like barter because it's not just about the currency, it's also about the medium. We even had a participant who, um, in, our, in our displacement where we were having people just spend Bitcoin, they were wondering if local Bitcoins was the same Bitcoin that the merchant would take because they're so used to having, say, three prices for Boulevard, one for a credit card, one for cash, one for bank transfer. They're all different. And so there's almost like this spider diagram that people use to assess um, the, different, the different currencies and mediums. So on the left side, you have a $20 bill, which is actually more valuable than a $100 bill. Because if you try and spend with a $100 bill, it's going to be very hard to get change. So how might we increase the interoperability or the ability of sellers to accept payments they find less desirable? So how do we create the system where it doesn't feel like barter and people can start to use, say, Monero or Bitcoin in the field and not have to worry about finding a seller who will take it? Another thing that we found in the field is that people, you know, certainly people are struggling. There's shortages of food um, and all kinds of products, but the restaurants are full. Um, and so there's almost like two Venezuelas, the one where people are comfortable and thriving, and then the other where people are struggling with extreme scarcity. And so elite members of society or rich members of society have these cocoons that they've built where they often have these social clubs where they'll pay a membership fee. And they're surrounded by other wealthy people who end up, you know, also ha who also have access to foreign bank accounts. So they've been able to preserve their wealth and their customers for their businesses. Um, and they're safe places to socialize. Um, we met a, a, a fellow named Guillermo um, who is actually minting money off the hyperinflation. So he will take a loan in Boulevard, buy a place in New York, and when the loan comes due, you know, it's worth something like a couple of percentage points of what the original value of the loan is. But for the banks who are getting repaid, their books are in Boulevard. So they've been repaid. They're fine. And this is part of sort of the government facade of everything is okay. Another thing that we found is that uh, most transactions are kind of forced to feel like drug deals. So with a lot of the socialist laws in place, um, like price fixing, for example, a lot of producers, you know, you know, for example, we met a fellow named Anton who was a farmer, coffee farmer, and the government has mandated coffee prices for raw produce. And that price is below the cost of production. And so certainly he wants to sell above the cost of production to stay in business and to also have enough to feed his family. 
There's also capital and forex controls. So converting your money from the boulevard is also illegal. So if you're going to do that to survive, it's also going to move to the black market or underground. And then there's product quotas. You know, you, there's product quotas. So in an extremely scarce environment, if you find a product that is valuable for you or your family, of course you're going to buy it up and give it to your family, but that's also illegal. So it's also going to be done underground in the black market. You know, even, even sending money, right? There's, there's no official way to send money in or out of Venezuela. Um, so if you look at this diagram, you know, I put Canada and the US on the left side because I'm, I'm Canadian. If I wanted to send money from my bank account to Jerry, so the, 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 the big circles are sort of the country financial system, the small circles are the banks. If I wanted to send money from my bank account to Jerry's, I would just initiate a wire transfer, simple. If I want to move money, say, I, say I'm uh, in Venezuela and I'm trying to get money out to my US dollar bank account, I have to find someone, this is a Hawala system, it's called a Hawala system if you've heard of it, um, I have to find someone who happens to have a bank account in Venezuela and the US and I give them my Venezuelan money and then the ball's in their court and hopefully they're going to fulfill their end of the deal and they will initiate a transfer from their US dollar account to the final US dollar account destination of my choosing. And that's, this is highly illegal in pretty much every country um, because to the governments, it looks like money's never left the country, right? But this is what people are doing to survive. We even met a woman, Lorena, um, who um, just like so many people, about five million people have left Venezuela, left um, for jobs, you know, for money to support her family that she left in Venezuela. And she showed us how she would hide money in her hair um, because the border guards would confiscate that money. She would hide money in her shoe. She even converted some of her wealth to gold and wore it over the border because she thought the guards would just think she's too poor to actually afford real gold. We also learned that networks of trusted people have replaced the roles of companies and institutions. So as the economy has crumbled and the government sort of shutters, the availability of basic resources and services through traditional commerce channels and government channels has drastically diminished. And so to fill the gap, there are these emergent dynamic networks, digital networks often, um, where people sort of look to products, look to find products or to sell products. And so I have two pictures here um, of someone using a WhatsApp status. So I didn't even know WhatsApp had a status function. It's just kind of like Instagram stories. And people will become part of, say, a group of their high school alumni or college alumni um, or some other association. And that trusted group is where people will post like, hey, I've got milk powder for sale, or I have a $20 bill for sale, or I'm looking to offload this amount of boulevard for $100. That's where commerce is happening now. And it's through these trusted channels. So, you know, often in this world of digital currency, we're often saying, you know, cryptocurrencies make it so there's no need for trust. But the reality is trust is needed more than ever in Venezuela. Everyone who's using Bitcoin has learned about it through friends that they trust or has used, it, has used uh, local Bitcoins, which enables people to trust people they don't know with an escrow system and a rating system. So the question really is, how might we elevate confidence and trust in new financial products and tools? And I often hear the word trustless, but, and I understand as a technologist where that comes from and why it's important, but we really do need to elevate trust and we need to start talking about confidence in these human elements in the field. So I want to finish here where I sort of started, where you know, we so badly want to believe often that a few lines of code can solve really complex and human problems, um, but it's often just one part of a system that needs to be designed for. And so with that, I want to say thank you and open up to questions. So recently, local Bitcoins got rid of all cash in-person transactions on their website. So how do you see that affecting Venezuela? And do you see it more going to these trust networks overall, taking a majority of it? Or do you see something else coming up that we don't know about? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, uh, so local Bitcoins in Venezuela is largely used not in person. 
I've, I've never heard of it being used in person. So in, in Venezuela, largely, uh, transactions are done by bank transfer because you, you know, cash, as much as it's extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily uh, devalued, um, it's also super scarce. It's very hard to get. And you'd probably need like a wheelbarrow of bills to pay for something small. So everything's done via bank transfer. And so if someone's using local Bitcoins in Venezuela, often what they do is they will just go online and look for someone who has great rating of you know, close to 100% um, thumbs up and then also has a lot of transactions. And the transaction will be done completely digitally. Um, the, the, the best way for now is to honestly just follow us on Twitter. Um, we are, we're a, a super early org. I mean, this, we, we founded our, our org in the fall 2018 and started the project in January. And so this is sort of like the, we're doing the conference circuit um, and starting to write about our, our research results. Um, we shared them with our clients, but we're not sure um, what goes on from here. So. Uh, the best thing to do is to follow us on Twitter for now. Yeah. What's kind of the open money initiative? Yeah, so we, we basically conduct applied research on collapsing um, economies in closed, or collapsing monetary systems in closed economies. So that's kind of our first, that is our first take on our mission statement. This, we, this project actually came about almost before the open money initiative was formed. So I met, my two co-founders are Jill Carlson and Alejandro Machado, which some of you may know or may have heard of. We all met on Twitter and we came, came into IDEO where I work, which is a design, global design firm, um, and then sort of came up with this project. And OMI was sort of the wrapper of how do we make this something that we think is important and people take seriously. And um, so we're, st we're, we're early and growing. Um, hopefully that, does that answer the question? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's actually nice to finally hear the third member. I've heard Alejandro and Jill on plenty of podcasts. So uh, thanks for coming out and chatting with us. Um, the two use cases that I tell people typically when it comes to cryptocurrency is for markets with hyperinflation and for uh, business cases in continents like Africa where you have SMS uh, text messaging for how people you know, transact money. So given that you've done a deep dive into Venezuela and the hyperinflation issues there, are there potential uh, studies or projects that you're going to be looking into like African countries and particularly how Bitcoin and cryptocurrency um, and privacy focused coins can benefit their business to business transactions as well? Or are you going to be really kind of like towing the Venezuela line moving forward? For now, for now we're focused on this project. We certainly would love to explore other, other countries and other places of human centered design research. But for now, this is our, this is our focus. So um, you spoke a lot about your project, which was very interesting and very impressive. So if you could kind of sum up what, are there any like really key improvements that people or, you know, that are just kind of low hanging fruit that are out there that can, that can help increase adoption or, or improve the lives of those in Venezuela? So there's, there's a couple things that come to mind. Um, I'm kind of trying to think in this context of you know, Monero cryptocurrency. And honestly, local liquidity is probably the most important thing. So when, when I think about some of the people I met, Bitcoin or Monero or any cryptocurrency, I say Bitcoin because it's the one that most people in the field know, knew. There was actually almost no other awareness of other cryptocurrencies besides the Petro, which is the government's, you know, scammy cryptocurrency. Um, Without local liquidity, it becomes another financial silo, right? And that's kind of what a lot of people are battling against is they have, they're financially siloed in cash or their bank account in Venezuela or they have money in the US that's hard to like bring over borders. And what's really special about local Bitcoins is that it has localized liquidity. And so I th the reason I think that's so key is because if you're trying to onboard people into new digital finance products or cloud banking, if we can even call it that, people have to feel the tangibility of it very quickly. They have to be able to use it and know that it's real. Or it's just some 
you know, some ephemeral digital currency when people have been used to this cash that they can spend anywhere. We have to have a way to make it for people who plug into a cryptocurrency to be able to use it very quickly. And to me, the bridge is local liquidity. So thinking outside of, of, of sort of the core things that I presented, what is most useful, I really think local liquidity. If I could, if I could dress as Steve Ballmer and be sweaty and said, instead of yelling developers, 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 I would be yelling liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. <laughs> Thank you.